Hi guys, I would like to chat with you a little bit about some heat emitter performance and uh, specifically the reason why um, we need to have some understanding of, of why and how this works is a lot of our control applications with what we do in hydronics is because of the way our heat emitters perform. And um, there are a lot of our systems out in the in the field that have systems that automatically adjust um, heat emitters or adjust the supply of water temperatures to the heat emitters and however that will indeed uh, be uh, certainly have some impact on the operation of those and the amount of heat that it gets out. There are also several uh, many many systems that don't have any type of of adjustability and there's all and there's reasons and and issues as far as why that goes. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at, at this so we understand the, the data and exactly how this works. So as an example on this particular handout on heat emitters, um, I just happen to select a, I happen to select um, a, a slant fin fine line 30 base part. Now this is just purely an example it there's nothing specific or particular why i chose this one other than this is very typical of the way all uh, types of baseboard will work in hydronic systems now typically um, normally what will happen with a baseboard is we'll we we typically would have your hot water supply line that will feed a certain amount of gpm gallons per minute of water flow through the heat emitter Inside the heat emitter, there's going to be a fin tube that's going to have a bunch of aluminum fins on this little device. So your copper line runs inside of here. The fins are around the outside of that tube, and we expect some heat to be flowing uh, out of this particular, uh, out of the water, over to the fins, from the fins to the air, and then we're, with any luck, we're going to have some nice warm air flowing out of these baseboard. Um, Typically, this particular type of a baseboard heat emitter is normally expecting that you're going to have some nice cool air down here that's going to flow, you know, into the bottom of that heat emitter, and then it'll end up um, moving out. So we're we're really basing this on almost completely by natural convection currents, uh, which would be typical of the way we would uh, generally do this. So. There's a lot of systems out there that use baseboard and it's probably a good idea to understand a little bit of how they work and what goes on with that. So really nice little system. All right, so uh, a couple little things about this. There are several different types of baseboards. So you can have baseboards that are, uh, for example, even from within slant fin, you can have commercial baseboard, you can have residential baseboard. There's low output, there's high output. There's, you can get them in half inch, you can get them in three quarters of an inch. Um, you, they make them even in bigger lines, in, in one inch, so for your, more of your commercial applications. Um, typically in residential jobs, most of the time people will use three-quarter inch um, copper lines that would go to and from those units. Now that's, that's the baseboard humidor itself, is copper. Now of course, the, you know, from a retrofit standpoint or exactly how you might do this, may very well be, uh, they might be using PEX tubing for all I know. Um, so it really depends on the application and how you want to do it. Certainly can use copper. Um, steel would even work as well, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that just simply because of the, the dielectric um, issues with um, any type of corrosion uh, between you know, the dissimilar metals between steel and the copper. So that's something to concern yourself with um, as well. Um, so let's take a look at add a little bit on, on this. So, a couple of things. I talked about the heat emitter itself, and uh, specifically what that might um, that might entail or look like. So the heat emitter is going to be behind this this cabinet. So when you when a person buys an assembly, you can either buy the element itself, which would be the the copper and the aluminum fin tubing gadgets that are in here, or you can buy an assembly, which would basically give you the housing that's right here all this stuff it'll give you and then what you have to do is you have to buy the end caps so the end caps um, would typically be 
either you'd need either the right end cap, the left end cap, um, so or you might have an inside corner or an outside corner depending on the application. So there's really a lot of different applications that um, you can use. Um, if you looked at um, some of the images specifically, if we were to look at figure 8-2 in your textbook um, and as well as in 8-3 the, in the modern hydronics heating textbook, you'll see a fin tube baseboard convector and you'll see kind of those elements and what they look like specifically uh, as well as inside corners, outside corners, extension pieces and so on and so forth. So this is just uh, another glimpse of it. Certainly um, I would uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at the textbook component of that as well. So let's talk some of the nitty gritty as, as far as performance and why it's important that we recognize this. So what uh, we need to be looking at, there's a couple of little things that I want to um, point out specifically. So I made mention about how this, this cooler air um, will proceed and progress um, into the system. So for example, this nice cool air is going to flow underneath the baseboard and it's, gonna, it's gotta have this gap that's in the bottom of this. It needs to have an air gap. So if you've got if you're doing anything that's going to restrict the airflow into that baseboard, um, even if even just because it's natural convection, you still have to have a path for that air to move, and um, it's there's no way to to avoid that. So that nice cool air has got to flow into that baseboard and then make its way through the baseboard on out. Now, if that hopefully that you know that baseboard once that's warm, once you get warm water in there, that that cooler air is going to progress in there. Now, when they rate these baseboards, believe it or not, they're actually rating those baseboards for 65 degree Fahrenheit air is the way that they rate the outputs out of these baseboards. So if you've got a customer that's thinking, I want to get 70 degree or 75 degree air going into the baseboard at that lowest point, your, your heat output will actually be lower by having warmer air go into the you know by keeping the building warmer so you have to take that into consideration when you're trying to evaluate performance as far as on how you're how you're going to make that work um, is the way that it works it's all based on the delta t so a big a big big component that determines the output is going to be the difference in temp between what this fin tube baseboard is and what this air temp is and that's going to have a, a significant factor on there so the one the one thing that um, we'll look at here on this particular uh, application sheet is this particular model they give you a, a they give you water flows at one gallon a minute and they give it to you at four gallons a minute so if I were to take an application and I say you know what I'm gonna basically give or I'm gonna have it at um, this circuit has maybe a, an output of let's say 30,000 uh, BTUs per hour if that's the output you need to provide, you're probably gonna have at a 20 degree delta T, you're gonna be using that formula that is 30,000 BTUs divided by uh, 500 times the delta T. Now typically with hydronics baseboard, and it's not that it's anything magical and you don't have to have it that way, but oftentimes they will try to have the system be around a 20 degree delta T which is typical um, for most of these hydronic systems that are running higher temp waters. So you could do it at 30 or 40, however, you have to make sure that it's designed for that. And there are almost no one does it other than a 20 degree if they do it at all. So that being said, 30,000 BTUs means your gallons per minute, in this case would be approximately three GPM. Now, that means that if you were selecting baseboard at three gallons a minute, you don't round it up to the four, you actually utilize the one GPM in its performance factor. So then that would be, you would use the one. So anything less than four gallons a minute is you're gonna wanna make sure you're using the one GPM roll uh, is how you're gonna do that. The pressure drop, I would don't even worry about that. I think we've talked about that in the past. Um, the pressure drop through the fin tube is 
normally going to be um, just I would just run it as straight copper length and a straight copper pipe and that's that's adequate um, for that system so let's talk about some of the output so in the rating system that we're looking at here in the rating system in the hot water rating systems you're going to notice that they give you the ratings in BTUs per hour now this is on a per this is on a per linear foot so this is on a per linear foot uh, rating so that means that if you are if you happen to have two feet or three feet or four feet you're going to have double of what these numbers are that are shown in here so let's specifically hit up on the outputs and so we can see what it's doing so at 140 degree water that would be supplied to a baseboard the output would be approximately about 320 BTUs per hour. If you raise the water temperature that is in that baseboard, and typically what they do is they, they utilize those numbers as the average water temperature within a baseboard. So why I say that is that that means that if I went into a baseboard, um, if I went into the first baseboard, uh, this will be my baseboard. If I went into that baseboard, and I went in at 200 degrees and I came out at 160, the average water temperature in this baseboard would, would simply be 180. So that would mean then the output numbers that we'd be looking at would be using 180 degrees as the, as the rough output of that baseboard. So that's kind of the, one of the ways they'll typically do this. Um, you'll notice that these outputs are uh, fairly proportional. So as a general rule, if you wanted to know the output at 195 or at 185 or something like that, you would just simply figure it out on a linear proportional basis. So 195 average water temp would be exactly in the middle of 640 and 710 uh, roughly as far as those BTU numbers. So that's just a couple of little things to note. All right, so additionally, I'd like to uh, go through a couple of little things on this. So I'd mentioned that at 140 degree water temperature, average water temperature in that baseboard, we're gonna get about 320 B2s per hour per linear foot. So if I've got um, 160 degree water, so let's say that I raise the water temperature to 160 degrees average in that baseboard, my output would now go from 320 up to the 450 degree uh, or 450 BTUs per hour per linear foot number. Now the significance of that is, is such that what it shows me is as, as I increase the water temperature going into that baseboard, my performance output into that baseboard would have increased and it increases, you know, a fair amount so if I want to have a system that has a little bit less B2 per output because I don't have the load on the system it would be to my advantage to make sure that I use lower water temp and I need to have systems and controls that allow me to do that to allow me to to adjust that water temperature accordingly that typically is going to be done at the boiler itself using some sort of a an automatic control system that will adjust that system. All right, so as you can also see, there is a, if I look at 200 degree water as an entry point into the baseboard, it's showing me that the output out of this particular baseboard at less than four gallons a minute would be approximately 710 BTUs per hour per linear foot. Again, just reiterating how the output out, out of the, the heat output out of baseboard will significantly change as a result of water temperature into this system. And that's true of all heat emitters. Um, it's a, the, the significance of water temperature control is, is, um, is, it extends to all types of heat emitters. All right, so I wish it were that simple as you just have to adjust the water temperature and these are the numbers and that's what they are. 
but it doesn't exactly work that way. Um, the, what the manufacturers actually do is, and I'm going to use this as an example for this. So what the manufacturers do is they actually take these numbers that they have at one gallon a minute, at four GPM, and all of these numbers that they're showing you here. Those are all, every one of these is inflated. Now you might say, well, what do they mean? What do you mean by that? They're inflated. They are inflated, they are inflated by 15% is what they are. Now, you might say, well, what, why would they do something like that? What, what, would, be the, the, what would be the reason behind that? That 15% is what they call a heating effect factor. All right, now, that heating effect factor is, it's a BTU number for whatever reason that they determined, they figured that they would inflate their numbers by 15% over the, over the actual measured heat output values to, I guess, either A, inflate their numbers, or, or B, to um, account for some additional losses that are going to occur as they travel from point A to point B. Um, so it's, it's something that there's a, been a lot of discussions over the last 20, 30 years where people have uh, written articles about how the manufacturer should get rid of the heating effect factor and um, it's not really of any value or anything at all. So a lot of those numbers in actuality are, are indeed that way. So how do you find out really what that, those actual values are? So for example, if I were to take um, an average water temperature within a system, so let's say if I, use, if I use a baseboard system, and let's say that my whole system that I'm running here, several baseboard, and let's say that that system happens to have 200 degree water starting at the beginning, and when we leave all of the baseboards and make our way back to the boiler system, we are down to 180 degrees. That would give me an average water temperature within the system of 190, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So now the overall system is such that at 190 degrees that they're showing right here, they are showing me that I would have roughly about 640 BTUs per hour per linear foot. Six hundred and forty BTUs per hour per linear foot. All right, now, if I were to take that number, divide that number, whatever the output that is provided in the tables, divided by a factor of one point one, whoops, one point one five, one point one five. That one point one five correction factor will correct the data to actual output uh, as tested. Um, in laboratories. So we're going to take a look and I'll figure that out here. 640 divided by the 1.15. So 640 divide that by 1.15 and that gives me about 556.5. So we'll just, there we go, 556.5. So, so the actual output is more likely to be 550 six uh, five fifty six uh, point five uh, b2s per hour per uh, linear foot now I want to expand a little bit on that and um, I want to show you where that's at in your textbook um, they do describe this heating effect factor and um, it's um, this specific one here is listed on page 286 in your modern hydronic heating and they talk about that 15% heating effect factor is essentially uh, uh, an actual 
uh, as I had mentioned, 15% higher than the actual measured value. And they talked about it where it was something, the history behind that a little bit um, goes back to when they were converting from certain types of baseboard convectors to baseboard and it never really panned out. I don't think it ever really um, was ever documented that we could even get that. So the um, John Siegenthaler, he who you know who happens to be just a, a pro on this stuff, he had noted this in his manuals or in his books from quite a few years ago already is that the authors, you know, his his recommendation is that take that 15% factor out of them. They cuz you can't really duplicate that. So he's got a a listing in here that describes and it shows what it looks like with and without the heating effect factor which of course would be um, better to remove that out of there uh, to see that. So that's a little bit on on that. So that would give you the actual output on there for this specific one. This one here is a different manufacturer that brings into some of the testing and so on and so forth. And this um, this one here happens to be it's Lanfin actually. Uh, my apologies. So the um, um, it looked like a baseboard model number on there for uh, Well McLean, but it is an actual slant fin one. So what they have done on this 15 series baseboard is you'll notice that they are they're also showing a lot of the things that I had that I had talked about earlier that shows the um, baseboard ratings of 65 degree entering air. It shows the outputs at one and four, similar uh, what we chatted about already. These include the 1.15 factor, so or include the 15% number on here. So when, uh, and it's identified right in there, um, in the, the middle of this page, it talks about it, and it includes a 15% heating effect factor uh, based upon those. And, uh, and there's a few other details that are in there, but yeah, it's very, uh, very good to, to look at those types of things. Um, so, the, there's a couple of different ways that a person can look at some of the corrections and, and the way that they will select these and correct these uh, systems. Um, I'm going to go to the next page here and I want to want to go right to this chart. And on this particular graph, this is in figure 8-10, and what they've done here is they have looked at the baseboard output on a, on a typical residential fin tube type baseboard and they have the numbers calculated with the 15% factor and without the 15% factor. Now, the table, the plotted table points uh, from that table, they're shown in the round circles and the parts uh, without the heating effect factor, which would already be corrected, would show the, with the 15% heating effect factor. So, as far as, you know, if you wanted to determine um, specifically what would that look like um, as far as how do I determine the output you would simply just take your figure out what your water temperature going into that um, baseboard or what that water temperature would be uh, as an average within that that baseboard and then essentially go straight up to that line and then straight over to the left to identify the uh, approximate output of that baseboard so that's kind of one way to do that there are certainly other ways that you can get really high tech, but that's really all that's needed to be able to do those types of things on there. When an individual does a sizing uh, or goes through and, and does the sizing or the load calculations for a job, they'll identify room by room by room by having, you know, let's say 8,000, 5,000, 3,500, 4,500, and so on and so forth, the B2 values of what those loads are in that room. And then what they're they're doing is they're saying, well, well, the average water temperature, if I do my loop correctly, assuming you have a 20 degree delta T, it's telling you that that would be that your circuit average water temperature would be roughly 10 degrees in the middle of that loop. So the example that they're showing here in step number one is they're identifying and saying using that equation A2, a, the average water temperature of the circuit is to be assumed to be 10 degrees less than the boiler output. And that is purely based on a circuit being 
are having a 20 degree delta T. So then they're using in that entire loop 160 degree water as the average. Now, if they take the, uh, from the values on this table, uh, 88 or figure 88, if we look at that one, it would come up to roughly at 160 degree, that would give me roughly 420 BTUs. So if you divided that by your 1.15, and again, we're using uh, table values, uncorrected numbers that are on there. And that came up with an actual corrected value of about 365 BTUs per hour per linear foot. So now what they're doing is they're actually taking what the load in that room is at, let's say, whether it's 8,000, 5,000, whatever it might be. And what, they, what you typically do is you take that load, you divide it by the BTU per hour per linear foot that you can get out of the baseboard, and then that determines how many feet of baseboard you actually need for that job. So for that room. So in the living room with a load of 8,000 BTUs per hour, you divide it by your average of a loop is 365.2. That would give you roughly 21.9 feet. You round it up to 22 feet is the way you would typically do that. The next room was a dining room at 5,000 and divide that out, you got 13.7. You're just gonna put 14 feet in it. You're not gonna chop off three tenths of a foot. So I don't think anybody would really do that. Um, there, you know, but that's really what you would figure into there. Now you just have to make sure you have enough wall space um, to be able to put that baseboard on, and you know your selection and location would be would be necessary. Bedrooms, you know, typical bedroom heat losses, and um, you know it might be 3,500 degrees or 3,500 BTUs per hour. Um, you know, three, four thousand in that area is very normal. And uh, again, divide that out, you get 9.6 or roughly 10 feet. And then of course the bathroom, uh, 1500 BTUs per hour would be a typical load in a bathroom. At, divide that out and you got 4.1. And again, one could say, well, geez, I might, you know, if the bathroom were on the end of the loop, you would say, gee whiz, I should probably just round that down. However, because it's on the end of the loop, you probably aren't going to get the 100 and, um, you're not going to end up getting the 160 degree water as an average in there. You're actually going to get less than that because your average water temperature is not going to, um, is not really going to be, you know, your average in the whole loop is 160. So what it means is this, is that the baseboard in those, in that bathroom is you're going to have to try to get maybe four to five feet in there, hopefully you have enough room to get the five feet, which is a challenge in a lot of bathrooms, is to be able to get baseboard in there. Most people's bathrooms don't have five feet of wall that they can put a baseboard on. So that becomes a little bit of a challenge. So that that's something that else that we'll talk about later as a different type of a, a unit that we can use. So that really, in a nutshell, is how you figure out how many, how many feet of baseboard you would put in that job, and then it's a matter of just doing the install. There absolutely is um, you know, one little problem with that method that needs to be at least dis discussed or described in the fact that the very beginning of the loop, you're gonna get the warmest water and you're gonna actually get more BTUs per hour out of those first baseboard. In the middle, it'll be more true and at the very end of that, you'll actually get less heating output out of the baseboard. So you have to make sure you are compensating for that. That is why the flow rate in your GPM of a loop is so significant because the flow rate uh, has such an effect on the actual B2 per hour, per hour output, which is really relative to the temperature. So if the temperature drops, you don't get the output it's really more related to the temperature as opposed to the flow rate. The flow rate has an effect on whether it's the, the flow rate, um, if the higher the flow rate, you get more turbulent flow, but it's not necessarily the, the true factor. So you, anyways, so the, the, that's why um, it's so important to recognize the outputs of these heat emitters, because that has such an effect on us as we control these systems on there. There is a sizing method or a second method and it's not super difficult, um, but it is one where it actually takes the entire system loop and it figures out what that average temperature within that baseboard, each baseboard is, and then it has it, then it actually calculates the true amount of baseboard feet, feet that you would need for an application. It's not, a, it's not a real difficult problem and it's one of those where 
with computers nowadays, a person could easily put that formula in a spreadsheet and punch in your B2 values and it'll figure it out to the T how many baseboard or feet of baseboard you have at any delta T that you're running in a loop. So it'd be very simple to be able to do that. So, and that's a, a fairly typical uh, worksheet that you would do. So um, I've done that in the past. I traditionally don't have you guys do that simply because of time. Um, looking at a completed one of these as an example, this will give you a rough idea of the output and the true numbers that would be uh, in there using that second method. And as you can tell, you know, living, dining, bedroom one, bedroom two, and so on and so forth, the outputs, and you'll notice how they show you inlet temps, they show you outlet temperatures um, going into those baseboards. And this loop, they had a 20 degree delta T, so we know our average was 160, and we knew that going into it. Um, however, as you can tell, our average is already spent on, by the time we get to the dining room, um, we're already, we've already lost some of those BTUs. Now, that's as far as the average water temperature, um, you'll notice that we're already right at that average in the dining room. So that's kind of one of those. So when you, if you did the calculated value of um, using that equation 8.6, you kind of get a rough idea, all right, the rounded, you know, you got 20.02, 13.6, 10.2, 13.99, 4 4.89, 4 you'll notice that the rounded values are very close to what the average one when you had a 20 degree delta C. What I would caution you all to recognize is that this works fairly good for a 20 degree delta T. But if you're running, if you have jobs that are running because of low water flow and they're running 40 degree delta T's and 50 degree delta T's, those people at the end of that baseboard, those rooms at the end of those rooms, so let's such as like the bathroom or this bedroom too in these examples, they would have such a, a low amount of output out of those rooms that those people would be very dissatisfied at that. So just a, a little word of caution on there. So that has, again, has such an effect on the, the output on there. So you really have to recognize that as a, a true um, way to look at that. So uh, there again, you can kind of get a little bit of an idea on there. So um, this figure 815 that I'm gonna just kind of zoom in on here, you'll notice on here they talk about method one and they talk about method two. So in method one, you would have cut off about two feet off the baseboard between method two and method one. And uh, method two would have been at the same, which makes sense because the average water temperature was actually um, in that loop in that second zone at 5,000 BTUs. So that's why that one's almost spot on. But then everything after that, you can tell in method one, you're just a little bit short. Method two, um, you'll notice the one room that really stands out, in my opinion, that might have been a problem is the one that had 4,500 BTUs per hour um, is uh, because of the way that one worked out. You had 12.3 feet on method one, but and you had 14 feet or 13.9 feet on base on that baseboard on level two. Again, it just reiterates the the importance of recognizing how important water temperature control is on those systems. All right, so one ad, one other thing that I'm going to actually go into a little bit on here is I wanted to talk, earlier I talked a little bit about, um, about the actual heat output and the operation and the fin tube. And um, a couple of things in, your, in these images here, they're showing the, the baseboard with a right and a left one in, in item C in this. They're also showing in item A the enclosure. And there's a damper. I wanted to, to mention that damper, you'll actually, you can rotate those dampers to minimize or to restrict the amount of airflow. Now, when you close those dampers, you, you minimize the amount of air that can move there. So that'd be no different than if you took some paper or you took a towel or something, you stuck it under the bottom of that air inlet slot and you prevented air from moving through that baseboard. So the damper is really the only method of control other than the water temperature control that you can do as far as uh, adjusting heat output. On the picture on your Whoops, on the picture on the right here, uh, item B, 
it just kind of reiterates what I was describing earlier about the cooler air at 65 coming into the baseboard. Um, I, you know, I probably don't need to mention this, but I'll mention it. When a person installs this baseboard, you'll notice on the very face of the baseboard of the fin tube, how that is actually not um, completely open. And the, the ones in the top are actually open. So when you install baseboard, you absolutely have to make sure that you're, you have the parts that are wide open that air can go through are actually on the top and on the bottom. I know it's a small detail, but that's an important factor when you're installing um, those types of systems uh, for an application. Okay, and I say this even because there's people out there that have them and they need to replace them. Um, I also mentioned earlier about the enclosures and uh, there's extensions, there's end caps, there's outside corners, inside corners, splice kits. Um, typically when you buy any length of baseboard, like a seven, eight foot baseboard, six foot baseboard, they usually will come, come with a splice kit, but you have to make sure you double check that on there. So again, real neat uh, little system on there. Um, but it works works great. Almost everybody, you know, when you install baseboard, you do your best to try to make sure you put your baseboard under the bottom, the lower part underneath windows. So really, you always want to bring your heat, the heat emitters, to where the baseboard or where the load would be. So it, because the window and that exterior wall is where the significant load is, it makes the most sense to try to do that. So that's fairly significant on there. So. One other factor that I want to hit up on here related to this uh, before I move on is the, the amount and the heat output out of these baseboards. So there's a fairly significant amount of output that will be radiant on these baseboards. And um, it's fairly significant because yes, one factor is the convection that they're showing due to natural convection, but the other part of that is certainly gonna be the amount of radiant energy that you get out of there. And obviously the higher the temperature of the baseboard emitter, the higher the amount of radiant energy that you're gonna get out of those, so that's typical. Um, I think it's definitely worth noting is to take a look at, um, you know, here's an application where they're showing very good base, good locations and not so good uh, locations. So for example, in uh, the, there's one that is shown in the upper left in figure uh, eight four. You'll notice that they have a door. Um, there's a baseboard that goes all the way up to that door. Now you're never going to be able to open up that door, so that's not really a very good application on there. Um, so that'd be a little bit, a little bit tough on there. The other thing is um, if you take a look at um, like around that chase that's showing on there. That's another spot that could be a little bit of a of an issue on there so again you don't want to get too cute so typically I think a lot of people would end up going down below something if they can do it but you try to um, to avoid um, those interference problems um, figure eight five um, this right here is typical of what you run into on jobs at that maybe are subject to damage uh, so let's say a high traffic area or um, somebody that had the baseboard uh, cover fall off and it, it will damage that baseboard. And if that baseboard gets damaged or is full of dust or dirt, um, it will, the results will be very similar, that the heat output out of those baseboards will be significantly compromised. The one other thing that I'm gonna, that I'll definitely point out that is, is absolutely essential is when a person um, is installing baseboard in an application, I'm gonna go back to this image here. So when a person installs that baseboard, you want to make sure the hole that you're cutting into that floor is sufficient, that it's big enough. Um, not big enough just to fit the copper tube in there, but large enough to handle the expansion. That as that copper tube warms up, you're going to get some expansion in the baseboard. And there's a certain amount of that will indeed happen. Typically, most people will try to make sure they have you know, uh, an extra, you know, half of an inch of hole around all of their their copper tubing. And if, and if it becomes a problem where it's a cosmetic issue, there is such a thing that you can put is uh, called an escutcheon. So you can get, actually get a little cover that swings and it closes that in. And that's typical of what a person might do. Um, I have, uh, this is um, in figure eight, six, they actually describe that in here about showing a half inch oversized hole through the subfloor.
um, really important to recognize that you need to do that because it will indeed expand. Uh, so that's, that's important. Um, I have had a couple of jobs where I have done the 180 bends um, where it was a, um, in an area that was on a concrete slab and I, I didn't have any place to run the copper tubing. So I would run it back so you'd have the supply and the return copper tubing in that same area. Um, so in figure eight, seven, they identify that. So if you can find the, those little bends, it's great and it's easy to use them, that would be nice. If um, in applications where I've done this, I've had to um, make my own U-bends um, by using some, uh, like a street elbow and a regular elbow coming out of the baseboard. And um, again, the, U, the nice U-bends are, are nice if you can find them, but um, the wholesalers that I was dealing with, they didn't, they didn't have those, um, but that's one option on there. So there again, that's a nice, nice one. Also, you, you'll notice in figure eight, seven, that the, um, that enclosure on the end, that little cover plate, that cover plate has a, has an, a hinge door on there. Some of the manufacturers do not have a hinge door. So you have to comp, you know, you have to make sure you recognize that, uh, to, to make sure that you're dealing with that. And you know, typically most of these are, are all soldered. So again, um, this is all things that are normally, um, covered and compensated in there. Um, the other thing that I do want to point out is that um, in this image on figure eight six and in figure eight seven, you'll notice how the baseboard, um, how the actual enclosure is sitting higher than the subfloor, and in fact, it's higher than the actual flooring materials. So it would be important to note that because when you're installing them, that's generally one of the issues that guys will ask is how high do I put it? So the, the recommendation um, by the author is to keep it a, a one inch above the subfloor and, um, and that would allow you to have enough room for flooring and things like that. So again, it's, uh, if it's carpeting, um, you know, you'll have a little bit of wiggle room in there. Again, you just have to be careful with that so you're not um, too crazy on that. But if you can, you know, if you happen to know exactly what that flooring is, um, then it's it's actually quite easy. You can just lay it out and say, okay, this is the height we need to raise it above that, as opposed to just using a flat one inch um, above the subfloor. So just something to note on there. So very good. All right. So I'm going to go to the next one here. When we deal with um, typical baseboard selection, and you have to be a little bit careful on this is if is that a rule of thumb that was used in our industry for many years was that the average output out of a baseboard so every linear foot the average what people use as kind of their rule of thumb is they always use an average output of approximately 600 BTUs per hour Per linear foot. Now, so if I went into a job, and why I'm mentioning this is that it's it's kind of a an iffy one. You got to be a little bit careful on this because if I were to use my my um, model 3075, that one, as you can see, based on the 190 at one GPM, we would have only got 556, and we would not have gotten a 600 at the 190 average water temperature. And I'm saying this because most people would have designed a system around a 200 degree supply water temperature in the first one, a 20 degree delta T, and that would give you an, an average in the system of about 190. Now, as you can tell at four gallons a minute, that number would have been slightly higher and closer to the 600. Now, if we take a look at um, the 30 uh, at the 75 WL, it's very similar on this. So it, again, it's just pointing this out that um, some of these rules of thumb can get you a little bit off on some of these things. So you might want to be very cautious about using that. Now, the beauty of this is that if, you know, of what I could take out of this is that if I had an application where the customer was, they have enough boiler BTUs, but they don't have enough heating output out of the baseboards, your solution is you simply just crank up the water temperature and put a higher water temperature in there and you have to adjust the controls to allow you to do that. 
and you can get the 600 out of there. All right, so what else can we do on this? And what else, what, what else can we do with this? So I wanna show you an application or I just wanna talk about an application like this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, show you an application that has, let's say an application where one of my zones has got some baseboard in an application and so on and so forth. Now, so let's say if I go into a job and I, and I want to have an idea of, you know, what's the, what's the approximate heating output that I can get out of my baseboard. So let's just, let's just say, for example, that I have from start to the end, to the finish, I've got roughly of, a, of a approximately about, let's say, 60 feet of baseboard. 60 feet of, of baseboard length. Now, how would, I, how would I use that information to help me identify, you know, what's the approximate BTUs of this zone or this loop is how would I do that? So if I were to use the approximate uh, number of 600 uh, BTUs per hour per linear foot of, as the approximate output, and I took that times 60, feet of baseboard, as you can tell, the feet of baseboard are gonna cancel out and I'm gonna have 60 times 600. Now what that's gonna give me in this particular case here is roughly, it'll give me an approximate estimated value of roughly around 36,000 BTUs per hour for that zone or for that loop. If I look at, all right, how many feet of baseboard do I have in this zone and how many feet is in this zone, I can estimate roughly about how many gallons a minute I should probably have in those loops and how many would be total for the entire job. And that might be a good way to estimate some of the output as needed on a job. So in this case, if this were this loop and I happen to have just for um, example, this is my zone valve, and let's say that the water is flowing into this loop and it comes back out and it goes back into the boiler common. So what would happen then is if I wanted to know what my flow rate should be in there, I would really be shooting for, at the using my typical formula that we use on this, is 36,000 BTUs per hour divided by the 500 factor times your 20 degree delta T, and as you can tell, we're going to have roughly about 3.6 gallons a minute that we need to move through that circuit. So this is another easy way to identify or estimate what would be going on in this, so as far as in that loop. And so if you had a loop that had, you know, uh, tw you know 20 feet of baseboard, um, you could easily do the same process of using the 600 or using maybe a more a typical number if you know um, obviously in every situation if you can figure out exactly what your real output is you should use that but in a pinch you certainly can get away with you can certainly get away with the um, with the average uh, that we typically have used in our industry and it works pretty darn good um, on that system so anyway so that's a little bit on that all right so what about those applications, fellas? When I've got a situation where my heat emitter data um, that I can get out of that out of that baseboard is such that I don't have enough I don't have enough room. I cannot get enough hydronic baseboard into that room. And typically, this ends up being in kitchens and bathrooms, and that's usually the problem areas. So how do they work, and what do they do? So what typically happens is under the cabinet, under the cabinet, they will put, um, usually it'd be right where, your, right where your feet would be, they would install under that cabinet a little device that looks a little bit like this one here. You'll see kind of the face plate on here, and you'll see the coil that's in there, okay? That's where the coil is. And you'll see in the very back of this, that's actually where the fan is. So this is a little fan coil. And what'll happen then is you'll simply um, 
purchase a certain model of unit that you have, you identify what you need for flow rate, and it'll give you an idea of how many BTUs you can get out of it. Now, as you can tell, the output out of these Tokek heaters are very high. And um, so you can have one little small Tokek heater that will really heat a space up fairly good. Um, and, it's, and obviously the higher the water temps, you can definitely tell the higher that water temp is, you can definitely tell the more BTUs you're gonna get. So just as an example, I'm gonna use a, a TK70 kick space heater and you'll notice that the B2 per hour output out of that unit at a 200 degree water temperature is about 5,979. And the at 180, dropping it by 20 degrees, you, got, you still have 5,075. So the point I wanted to make is that I would likely, because of the, of the amount of energy that they're pulling into here, it makes a lot of sense to put a toe kick heater uh, like these near the ends of your loops, if at all possible, because of the fact that you can get so many B2s out of them. There are very few bathrooms where you're going to be running um, B2 numbers that are going to exceed, you know, three, four thousand B2s for uh, most people. So there are, they are out there, but there are, you know, that, that's really the big issue on there. So the other thing, look at the gallons per minute. One GPM, um, three gallons a minute and you'll notice that we picked up about 500 B2s, 450 to 500 B2s in capacity at that 140 degree water temp. And uh, if we take a look at the higher one between one and three, we, gain, we actually gain about um, six to 700 B2s roughly is what we gain on those things. So it's uh, to give you a rough idea of about the impact of water flow, as you can tell, yeah, the, the water temperature has a far um, much more significant factor on output out of a unit. In the textbook, we uh, modern hydronic heating, in figure 823, they show kind of a little face plate on the bottom of that, of that unit. And um, they also show you know, the coil in item B that shows the face plate, the coil, the fan, and so on and so forth. I think the biggest, um, area that a person has to um, deal with in these applications or why somebody would even use them is certainly in cases where when you need uh, wall space for cabinets and that's typically where my emitters are going um, you just don't have the room my biggest concern that i have with these toe kicks would be the pressure drop of the coil and the ability to get your water flow through these units so um, and primarily a reason why i'm mentioning this is because most of your coils um, the in and out copper tubing in most of these coils are usually around a half of an inch copper or one half inch copper. So for you to get three gallons a minute through a half inch copper tube is really going to be very, very difficult and if not impractical. So you might want to be uh, more conscious or cognizant to, of that. So that really requires you to then rethink your process to where you might need to limit that circuit to a lower water flow. Um, and also maybe a circuit that doesn't have more than 15 to 20,000 BTUs.